45 minutes. Yo, what's going on, family? Joseph Solomon here. The Shores with Joseph Solomon. This channel specifically tries to wrestle with deconverting from the Christian faith and all the experiences that come with that. And today I wanted to talk about something that uh, I was actually comment. I, I, you know, this is what I got to do. You know, they're, they're right. I, somebody said, man, you be in these comment sections. I be in the IG comment sections, man. And I don't need to be doing that <laughs> as much. But every now and then a, a, a video from like a Christian apologist or something like that will come across my Instagram feed. And uh, I'm guilty. I still am interested in the conversation of faith and reason or faith and science and that. And like, I think I always will be. I always have been. I don't think that's ever going away. I think that's why this channel exists in the first place. And I want to talk about today um, the relationship between science, modern science and faith, or more specifically, the relationship between modern science and orthodox or conventional theology. I'm specifically not saying the relationship between science and God or the discovery of God. I think those things are two very different things. And I, and I hope that I'll be able to explain that today. This has not been very well thought out. I'm really going off the cuff right now. Um, it's just some musings around this. And I'll even try to read the comment that I made to this video so that you can kind of get some context for where I'm coming from. So I watched this video of this guy. Maybe I'll just insert it. Here. I'm not going to even get into trying to point out the philosophical assumptions that are made in this. I, I think there's some logical leaps that the guy is making uh, for convenience, but that's not really the point of my video. The point that I want to make is the disingenuous or imbalanced relationship between theology and faith. And so the comment that I left, because I'd be in the comment section, is this. This always comes off as disingenuous, much like the theologian who, quote unquote, eisegetes scripture and picks and chooses what parts suit his needs. The Christian apologist embraces science when it can be tailored to its needs, but disparages it when it doesn't. Do you know how we came to the Big Bang Theory? This theory that he's alluding to here. Observation of the accelerating expansion of the universe. Scientists notice that, hey, the universe planets are racing away from each other. Matter is racing away from each other. And they came to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. This was this is what we realized before the Big Bang Theory came to be. And then also cosmic background radiation. So these observations, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, as well as cosmic background radiation, led us to believe 
this about the universe. One, the universe had natural explanations for its current state, the way that it is right now, the way that it is expanding and is increasingly expanding, racing away from each other. And then two, that the universe is billions of years old, not thousands. It is billions of years old. This is how we got to the big, all this is related to the Big Bang Theory. Both of these observations, Christians, and I'm sure this guy, vehemently object. So if you reject these things, you also have to object to science's theory of the Big Bang. You can't take the Big Bang theory and then also reject how we got to that conclusion. It's, it's disingenuous. Um, if you object to this, then you have to also object to the, th the theory of the Big Bang and then and then come up with other explanations for the, these phenomena. But Christians usually don't. They wait for scientists to, you know, cosmologists, astrophys astrophysicists, evolutionary biologists, etc. They wait for them to do the real science and then appropriate or dismiss it at its leisure. And so then, uh, actually, a friend of mine responded to me in the comment section, Doe Jones, really sweet person, too. I don't know if we're friends, per se. We, we have a lot of mutual friends. We interact. We're, I've known her for a, for a while. And she says, I feel like I've seen Christian arguments for the Big Bang, which is true. And I've also seen arguments for the age of the universe being billions of years old. I actually believe science and Christianity can healthily walk hand in hand. And... I don't fully disagree. So I said, hey, though, yes, I know Christians who believe in the Big Bang as well as an old earth. Many of them even broadly accept evolutionary biology. I would never say you couldn't believe in Jesus while also agreeing with broader themes from modern science. I guess my real pushback is the age old idea that science is theology's handmaiden, that theology can inform science, but science can only do the will of theology. For many Christians, science can inform theology of its findings, but it cannot command theology what to do. So theology can use or misuse science at its own leisure. Notice I'm, I'm saying theology's handmaiden, not God's handmaiden. It is, the the, it is, it is of theology. If science and faith are truly to be hand in hand, then it must um, then it must allow faith to command us what to do with science. But science must also be able to command us what to do with faith. But I don't think most Christians want to allow that. And I think that's what I want to get at the heart of when people say faith and science can exist Together, they can go hand in hand. You can you can have faith and also agree with modern science in theory. That is that I can see that being possible, but in function and practice, how people typically go about that is not that at all. It's not this hand in hand thing. There is a hierarchy that there is theology first. My understanding of who God is and what God is like and then science comes second. And whatever I've already decided about God, which is my theology, again, it's not God. What I've decided about God is not God itself. It's it's what I've decided or what we've decided as a group of people have decided historically uh, or denominationally about the nature of God. I decide that that gets locked in and then that will tell me what to do with whatever science comes across the table. There is an imbalance in the power structure of this. And that's obvious, right? Again, the claim being that God is the highest thing. So why would I allow modern science, which changes all the time, they change their mind about things all the time. And yet when science does find something, whether they change their mind about it later on or not, if science finds something that Christians can see and appropriate and say, hey, oh, or not just Christians, Muslims as well, religious people as well. They find something and say, oh, this goes with my theology. I can take that. And then when science discovers something that doesn't go with their theology, rather than allowing that science to inform or even command the person what to do with their idea of God, their concept of God and 
God's nature, a.k.a. their theology, rather than allowing the science to to uh, say something to the theology, they say, oh, no, that, that just can't be right when we flat out dismiss it. I think this is disingenuous because the reason why I think that in this sense, in a functional sense, science and and theology are often butting heads is because there are different motivations for how we come to theology and how we come to science. Theology, for the most part, is a closed, a closed system of thought. So you have a canon of scripture, scripture that's already been written, theology. Even if you don't know the theology yourself, say there's a doctrine about God that you don't know yet, it has already been set in place. And anytime someone tries to deviate or progress beyond what the broader Christian community has historically believed, they are put on the chopping block as a heretic. And there's this it's to be called in question because in in theology, older is better. There's always a, a, a resurgence, a call back to the, you know, the church fathers and the scriptures themselves, not even just church fathers or early church history, but the scriptures themselves. Uh, if you want to get even more closed in the system of thought, because, yes, the early church fathers are most Christians would say or early church thinkers and philosophers are not inerrant, but they're a little closer to what traditional Christianity may be. Let's just talk about the scriptures. Then the scriptures are still a closed system of thought. There's no progressing that needs to be had. The word of the Lord endures forever, that God's word is eternal. This thing has been locked in place. And there's no notion that maybe the authors of, of scripture, of divine text, had a certain understanding of God that was limited and that maybe people along the way later on could add something to that, that Christianity could evolve or Islam or whatever could evolve from uh, where they started at to understand more about God. And the distinction here being is that your theology evolves, but people, when people hear that, oh, your theology evolved, it prog it's progressive. It makes it seem as if you're trying to suggest that God changes. But that's not saying that God changes at all. It's just saying that your understanding of him, not just individually, but as a group, as an entire religion, can evolve from what you knew, what was understood, what was written then, and continually can be progressed. And, and if that was that type of open system of thought, then, uh, then science could do more to inform that. But that's not the case at all. It's this is what we know, and we are very reluctant to to hop on to what science says um, until it says something that agrees with us versus science largely is an open system of thought. Yes, old thoughts do stick around for a little while. And there are people leading scientific thinkers, um, not just in, you know, in recent day, uh, years, but, you know, for a long time, people would hold on to what was already said and it was hard for them to progress beyond that, you know, um, when Einstein comes up with this theory of general rel relativity, I mean, he was a laughing stock because there was already an understood uh, method or system of thought. But nonetheless, it is still in practice, even if it's difficult, it's still in practice is an open system of thought because there is always the potential for someone to come and challenge and then over time, if there's a, you know, if it's proven more and more, if people start to uh, test these theories and, it, and these theories come out to be true more and more, this becomes the most consistent way to explain phenomenon in the world, then out with the old and in with the new. And so we were allowed we were allowed to bring in um, the general the theory of general relativity. But if science had the same sort of motivation or system of thought like um, like theology, then general relativity, which 100 years later, and we're still standing on the shoulders of Einstein. But if they had the same sort of culture as a as as a theology, as a the theologian, then whatever was old is best. 
There's no there's no space for new understanding. And so if that's the case, if one is canon and one is always up for interpretation or not even just interpretation, um, but up for complete revision, then the one that is stagnant, for, at least for the Christian, at least for the faithful, the religious, that becomes a priori, the thing that is assumed first. And so science, it's not really a hand in hand relationship. Rather, I mean, it is a hand in hand relationship, but it's not as a it's not an egalitarian relationship. Yes, they may be holding hands, but the wife does whatever the husband says and whatever the husband says um, cannot be up for critique. She must submit to the husband rather than there being a sort of mutual submission. There's not a mutual submission between science and theology. I think that's extremely lim limiting for the religious. So, for instance, just because your theology may evolve doesn't necessarily mean that your God evolved or progressed. We can take, since we're having this sort of dialectic here, you have the, the, the other side of it being science, right? So we can use that as a metaphor. So relative to the human experience, the lifespan of a human, the universe is eternal, like metaphorically speaking. Obviously, because of the Big Bang Theory, we know that the universe is not literally eternal or that the earth is eternal. The earth is billions of years old. It is, uh, what is it like four four billion years old, something like that, 3.8 or something like that. It's been around for a really, really, really long time. And we had assumptions of how the earth worked and how it was in relation to the sun. We thought that the sun actually revolved around the earth. And we had all these ideas of how um, the universe worked, and yet our knowledge of it was allowed to evolve through the centuries. But the Earth, more or less, has been the same for billions of years. It has not changed. The universe, more or less speaking, has been the same for billions of years. Yes, there's been some very huge errors in that, but I'm just, can I speak broadly for now? Um, it's been the same. There's not been, uh, and even the laws of physics, those for sure have been the same since day one, but our understanding of it has evolved to understand it better. So I can take that same idea about God. Like, so just because my knowledge of God evolves, not just as individuals, I know that Christians allow space for that. You know, that's the whole sanctification process on the individual level but there's not a broad sanctification level for the theology of the church as a whole, that there, that it is, it is something inherently wrong and something inherently sinful about even considering that there can be an evolution of, of thought when it comes to our knowledge of God collectively, because God remains the same. And so religious people make it seem as if the evolution of your concept of God collectively is the same as saying that God changed. But it's not, as I can say, as we can see in our, just because our concept of the universe has evolved over the years doesn't mean the universe itself has evolved. Just because our concept of the laws of physics has evolved and it continues to evolve and it still is an open, a huge open frontier when it comes to quantum physics, it doesn't mean that the laws of physics or the laws of quantum physics, classical, uh, classical physics or even uh, uh, quantum physics has changed. It has been the same. We just haven't discovered it yet. And I don't I think it's those two fundamental approaches to knowledge of the universe and knowledge of God that keeps them from really becoming um, one and allowing there to be this this tug and pull of theology and science. There will never be a tug and pull of theology. It's always going to be unequally yoked. There's going to, you know, the, the, the concept of un, unequally yoked is that you have two animals, two different animals of, of very different strengths. And if you yoke them together and they try to do the same work and they try to work together, eventually the stronger one's going to start dragging the weaker one. And that's the idea for the Christian or the religious is that the the, the theology is eventually going to begin dragging the science and telling the science to do and to go wherever it wants it to go. And I think that's um, unfortunate. 
um, because I think it limits people, even people who are. Now, this is not every Christian, though, because I do believe that there are some Christians out there and they may be considered more progressive um, in thought. And, and they're, again, they're seen they're seen they're made to seem more inherently wrong for being open or too open or more open than 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 the average Christian uh, to allowing science to have an egalitarian relationship to their understanding of God. And the only way that can happen is to be disingenuous at some point with the science. That's sort of my made my other sort of major qualm with that as well is that one day they believe one thing and now it's it's this and they say that as if that's a bug in the feature that's that's uh, a bug in the system that's a feature of the system you, you want that you want that there would be if something was proven to be wrong it can be thrown out we i i hope that you wouldn't want to go to a medical doctor who's still practicing the scientific practices of the 1900s <laughs> You know, they were doing some wild stuff. They were cracking people's skulls like when they were <laughs> and, and, and draining. What's it called? A uh, uh, lobotomy and stuff like that. Like, you, you know what the like the cure for the scientific prescribed cure for the common cough was heroin. <laughs> not a cough drop, not cough syrup, not no Tylenol, no Robitussin. It was heroin, bro. Heroin. Oh my gosh, yes, out with the old and in with the new. Like, But it's not to say that science knows nothing. I think that's the disingenuous part of it, is that Christians will love to say, see, modern science says this, it, it upholds what we believe about our theology. But when theology, when science says something that is opposed to their current theology, their stagnant understanding of God, then... It's like, oh, well, you know, science doesn't know. They keep changing their mind. Do we really know? How do we know the earth is billions of years old or the universe is billions of years old? Were you there? Is it observable? Is it repeatable? So they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to have their science and also ruin it too. And I guess it's it's subjective. If you were someone who would want to allow science, modern understanding of of the reality of nature to inform your theology, you'd want to tread lightly because theological fidelity is of utmost importance to you. And yet there needs to be space for your understanding of God to Evolve, even when it feels consequential to your theology. And I'm, I've struggled to think of a consequential uh, point right now, but an inconsequential, or maybe even consequential, depends on how you look at it. You know that song, So Will I? A hundred billion galaxies are born. Yeah, that is a true statement. That is that modern science believes that there are at least in the known universe, in, in the observable universe, there is a portion of the universe that is because of the rapid expansion of the universe, we will never be able to see even with telescopes that light cannot travel over that horizon. We understand that there are 100 billion galaxies. What does that do with your theology? It may say, oh, well, man, that just means that my God is bigger than I first imagined. I just don't know why that that can't be the sentiment for many other things of scientific finding. Like when we find that that the universe is really that big, and it goes and it makes you go, "Wow!" I thought we, had, you know, imagine that type of view of the universe compared to someone who lived, you know, a hundred years ago, and we thought that we were the this was the only solar system, or I forget when we just found the other another galaxy, but. Okay, so I'm actually editing this video right now, and so I just wanted to look it up. Like, when did we discover that we weren't the only galaxy? And it was actually 100 years to the year, 1924, that we discovered that we were not a lonesome galaxy. So I thought that was pretty cool. All right, back to the video. Whenever that was, like, um, there was a relatively recent time that we thought that we were the only solar, we were the only solar system, the only galaxy. And so... When we find that there are a hundred billion others and how insignificant that makes you feel, it may give you some sort of tangible 
concept to your relation to an infinite God. And you may say, wow, my God is much broader than I thought he was initially. Why can't that be the case for, let's say, evolutionary biology? The typical approach of a Christian is that, well, God specifically created Adam and Eve. In, in a moment in time, he created uh, fully developed organisms, not just humans, but animals, um, and not just organisms, but even the earth, the rocks, the sky, the, the universe in general was all created in a moment at, a, at, a, at, at his word. It was created. And we say, wow, see, that's, that's a big God. That's a really, really big God. And I like that. But then evolution comes along and it challenges that notion that there was ever a moment, a specific moment of creation, but rather um, gradual development of organisms over long, long periods of time. And that doesn't seem worshipable. Well, it doesn't fit the theology, for one, the, the, the literal six-day creation and the literal Adam and Eve. It doesn't fit that theology. And so by default, we must now say, well, that type of science is or that type of scientific discovery doesn't lead me to a more worshipable God, a more admirable God. Rather than thinking, well, maybe God is broader than that. And God decided to, in a moment create this small, dense point in space and time that it, that expanded at the at the Big Bang. Um, and then we have the gradual cooling down of the universe and then we speed forward and we have the formation of 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 large mass like planets. And then from there, from a very simple, simple form of life, we got all these other complex forms of life. Is that not equally wondrous? Like, why does that inherently have to be less wondrous that a creator could not just cre make creation, but a creator could create creation that can make creation autonomously and yet still be intimately involved with the process along the way, much like a woman who gives birth to a child. Like any religious person would say that, especially for the pro-lifer, they would say, oh, yes, God is intimately involved in at every point of pregnancy at, from conception to birth. God has his hand in the creation of a life. God brought this baby forth. When I see this baby come forth, it is a miracle of God that they came through this way. And yet we also know that science will flat out tell us like, well, we know the process of, of pregnancy. And there are very natural explanations that not only we can we explain, but we can just see with our own eyes the gradual growth of a human life. We know that, well, two people have to come together, have sex. The sperm fertilizes the egg. And we know that whole we know that whole process of this is a micro example of life creating life in a gradual form and still have space for our God to be big enough to be intimately involved with the entire process. But when it comes to the larger scale, that seems unfathomable. Like, oh, well, there's no way that God want to do that. He has to have a specific creation. Again, it it is a limitation to the to the broader scope of the ability of God. But really, it's just an affront to your theology that, well, if you don't have a literal Adam and Eve at some point, then you also don't have then that messes up our uh, if we don't have a first Adam, that messes up our second Adam, who is Jesus Christ. And if we don't if we're not all sinners under Adam, then we can't all be saved under Jesus. Um, Jesus is how does that how is he sinless? And how is there even a, a moment in time where there was a sinless world if we all got here through suffering and violence and com competition of life over a course of billions of years? Leaves a lot of gray. I don't have an explanation for that. But it's not to say that you could somehow no longer have s space for that. Y you, your science, you're not allowing the science to inform or at least not you just inform, but expand your concept of God to where it becomes more gray. It feels more comfortable to have a more specific definition of what that looks like and not just specific, but stagnant. And so that's why there's so much polemic 
and controversy between faith and science because as science continues to move into the horizon, theology wants to stay here. That's how I feel theology treats science. It's like, it's not that your science should fit up under your theology, but wouldn't the more pure and true way of doing this, uh, and I may sound like the serpent in the garden for some of y'all, I don't know, but wouldn't the more pure and true version of this be that your science fits up under God, not up under your theology? And if that's the case, then your theology should always be up for grabs. And I know you don't want that because then if you let a little bit up for grabs, then the rest of it might go away as well. Like me. <laughs> um, but, I, I, but I'm not I'm not opposed even now, even currently, I'm not opposed. When people ask me, like, would you ever become a Christian again? Would you ever have faith again? Do you ever would you ever like? live a life that is actively believing in God. Um, I, I, I doubt it. But if I were to, one, I'm not against it. I wouldn't be surprised by it, but it would look drastically different than it did before. It would be much more broad in scope. Um, it wouldn't be as dogmatic because I would want um, the evolution of humanity, human thought, and the understanding of the world uh, to be able to also, not not without checks and balances, without critique, not at all. I'm not saying blindly accept whatever science tells you, but there has to be some level of it being able to speak confidently to what my concept of God or ultimate reality is. I hope I haven't gone over time because I thought I put a time on and now I'm realizing that my timer is definitely not on. So hopefully it's under 45 minutes. <laughs>